Great Parents podcast. I am Molly and I'm a not great parent and this is Nathan, my co-host, and he is also a not great parent. Not a great parent. And, uh, hopefully a good one. Yeah, I think on, on my good days, I'm a good one. I, I try to be the best I can and uh, because we are trying to be people who, no matter what's going on in our life, no matter how great it is in the eyes of the world, uh, I can ultimately live in God's goodness. And I think that's the promise of Jesus that he brings to us is, you know, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, blessed are those who Mm -hmm. mourn. Blessed are those who are poor. And when he means blessed, he means happy. Mm -hmm. He means almost, and I've I've used this before, I've heard some theologians say that the word actually is closer to a translation of almost congratulations. Like congratulations when you're poor. That's neat. I've never heard it that worded that way. Yeah, that he, because in the way I understand it for them is that the word, that the Greek is makarios, can mean blessed or blessings, Mm -hmm. or it can mean happy, but that it often was used as a greeting. Uh, And once again, I don't know this, I've just read it, so it could be totally false, but the way they say it is, people would come up and say, blessed are you, like. I think I've heard that before. Right, that when they'll come up, they'd say makarios, like when you graduated, they didn't graduate high school, but when they graduated high school, when you got married, when you had a baby, blessings on you. Isn't that and kind that, of like mazel tov? Is that yeah, I think it's a, a, a fair kind of similar thing. And he, the person I heard say it is that it's almost as if Jesus is doing this thing is a little shocking when he says, hey, congratulations when you're poor. Congratulations. Would you ever hear somebody say that in this day and age? No, exactly, right? Congratulations when you drop out of high school. Mm-hmm. Congratulations when these you know, when, when you, you don't mourn. win the big award. <laughs> yes, exactly. And then he goes on and he says, because the kingdom of heaven are, is yours, right? Mm-hmm. Or because if you mourn, you'll be comforted or all these different things. Uh, and in some way, what we've been trying to really do through this podcast is help parents get their minds around, hey, the greatness that so many of us pursue, mm-hmm. you know, our kids graduating, uh, you know, top of their class mm-hmm. or you know, having the perfect job or, you know, never having any emotional, relational strife. Right. Just the easy life that comes with lots of experiences and success markers as the world would define successful. And they go on and they have this great job and everything is a-okay. Yes. That's the goal. Yes. And somehow the pursuit of that... um, often detracts from our pursuit of what God says is good, Mm -hmm. right? The life that God says is good. Now, it doesn't mean that if you pursue God's goodness, you won't get some of the greatness thrown in. Oh, no. But it does mean God's goodness is our ultimate pursuit, right? Jesus said, Mm -hmm. seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, what he says is good. Uh, And all these other things, as we have said before on this podcast, they're kind of like sprinkles. They get added in. And if you get them, hey, that's great. But honestly, you're not even that excited about the sprinkles. Right. Right. And so we've been talking about that, but we've also been talking about how parenting makes us crazy. (laughs) It's like dropping the sprinkles everywhere. That also makes me crazy. (laughs) It's when the sprinkles, it's when you try to, that's a real, I like that. It's when you're, it's when you're trying, you're making an ice cream sundae or something, you know, when you have to make it Spill the dang sprinkles or too many go on it and it ruins the ice cream and yeah. So I used to work at an ice cream store. Oh, so you probably have had love hate with sprinkles. So I had had a day where uh, I was the assistant manager and the, here's, here's how dysfunctional the store was most of the time. I was made assistant manager before I turned 17. I was in charge of ev- almost everyone in the store. The general Were you manager, the best scooper? Is that why? I guess why. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. I think it's just because I was there and I knew how to do And everything. you were reliable. Yeah. Yes. And now I learn, I think they were pinning a lot of things on me. Because when we would <laughs> fail inspections, they'd be like, well, what do you expect? Do we, we have, have a 17-year-old running the place. And I'm like, you... But you made that choice to hire me for this. Me. You know, whatever. But... <laughs> One day I'd had, as you often have, especially, well, I I have this now with adults as well, so I guess it's not just teenagers, but no one showed up for their shift. Okay. And so I'm calling people in at the last second, and I'm kind of frustrated because I dated now my wife in in high school, and so I was like, we had a date that night. I was Mm -hmm. frustrated that I'm like, oh, this whole thing's going to get messed up. I'm going to have to stay here. And And then on top of all of that, as someone finally gets there, I go to uh, the way that we did it when you would put sprinkles on an ice cream cone. You could either scoop them in there or you could take, if the ice cream was secure, you could dip (laughs) it into the sprinkles. So I dip it all in the sprinkles. And as I turn, because I'm rushing, as I turn the corner, I knock this whole, I mean, it's probably this big of a Uh container 
uh, of I so for people that don't know, I'd say it's probably a quart. Oh gosh, of sprinkles? two quarts, not of that sprinkles. little thing you get at the grocery store. When I just filled it up. Oh, so it's huge. Of sprinkles onto the floor, it spills out all over the floor. <laughs> I walk, can the customer their thing, get, get get that, I clock out, and I walk out the door. <laughs> Someone else can deal with my sprinkle problem. Yes, and then later that day, uh, I got on my MySpace page. Oh, there you go. Yeah, somebody, somebody sent you a note. Someone commented and goes, hey, there were a bunch of sprinkles on the floor. <laughs> what? Do you know anything about this? Uh-huh. And uh, not a good example, but I know the life of trying to manage too many sprinkles. Too many sprinkles. And they all fall on the floor. And at some point you go, I don't even have the energy anymore to clean this so, up. I don't even want to deal with the sprinkles. But when we are focused on the sprinkles, we often have to, no energy to deal with the goodness that God has, right? So or this, certainly to even or enjoy Or to it. enjoy it, right? Yes. So we're so wrapped up in all the sprinkles so you could have just gotten on the floor and worked, figured out and picked up all those yeah. little sprinkles and then missed out on, you know, some yeah. other thing. That all the other mattered. things that go on. But I certainly think in the midst of it, and this is what we've been trying to talk about mm-hmm. in, this, in this series, is this idea of, um, like we've said, pursuing great not only takes away from God's goodness, it takes away just from our enjoyment of life. Oh, yes. Um, and because often a lot of, um, not all, but a lot of um, when we talk about mental health, when we talk about the anxiety we face, right. uh, when we talk about the stress that we have, the kind of hurry that's in our lives, it, it really comes often from this pursuit of greatness and things aren't going as I want them to, or I'm worried that they won't go as I want them to, or that people won't think of me in the way that I want them to. Right. I think that one's really heavy because I think a lot of times we might not even want the great thing, right. but we want to be seen as great. Right. And so we're going to pursue that or we're going right. to you know, focus our attention on that. And so I think that in and of itself can be very, com- com- very much a conflict in your brain. Right. And so we get to this place where where now in our society, and we talked about this in previous episodes, as really if, if you could measure greatness, which we can't, but I mean, we can look at standards of living, right. you know, affluence, right, uh, mortality rates, crime rates, all the metrics you would want to see, greatness is growing in our country. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, so is all of these mental health problems of right. anxiety, depression. depression, right, loneliness, all these kind of struggles that people have. Um, and we've been trying to address in this whole time, you know, from the beginning, we've said, what does Jesus want from my mental health? We said, Jesus wants you to be emotionally healthy, mm-hmm. right? Spiritually healthy and mentally healthy, physically healthy as well. Right. And often uh, the struggles of parenting just brings out all oh. of these underlying problems. Yeah, it just intensifies and magnifies a lot of other things that are going yes. on that we maybe haven't dealt with. Yeah. So I know in recent episodes, we talked about that as, yes. you know, as parents, we hear a lot about our children's mental health. We hear a lot about these things, but really uh, we broke it down and said, we want to address that. But really in order to address even our children's you know, mental yes. health or just the emotional health of our family, we have to be aware of our own <laughs> right? and we have to start with our, with ourselves, Yeah. which is often not fun. Yeah, and so we've tried to look at some things of how do I address my own mental health? How do I address my own emotions? How do I look at these things before I can talk to my kids? And I think a big part of that when you're addressing any problem is getting common language around things. Yeah, because I think especially in things that are kind of, I don't want to say buzzwords, but talking about mental health or yeah. you know things that impact us, everybody kind of walks around with a slightly different definition, I think. Yeah. Not and, always, but somewhat. Well, and <laughs> go ahead. I'm just sorry. My brain is going in different directions. What I want to talk about, but I'm not. I'm just going to say it and people can figure mm-hmm. out what I mean later. Oh, they will. <laughs> However you choose to define something mm-hmm. is a form of um, teaching someone. And so what I mean is how you def- the the language we use to define things. So, for example... 
Uh, I'll just use one that's not politically charged at all. Let's use okay. the word justice. Just, oh gosh, okay. So when I use the word justice, depending on where you may lean, you either think of that word positively or negatively, depending on how you hear it. Mm -hmm. Because you might hear it as social justice. Mm -hmm. And if you're leaning in that direction politically, and you go, yes, the government should be doing more social justice, or you hear that and you think very negatively around the word justice because it makes you think of social justice, or you hear justice and you hear law and order, mm -hmm. same thing, political leaning. Mm -hmm. If you're very, you're like, oh, we need to be lighter on that, right. or we need to be tougher and stricter. We're using the same word justice. Right, because meaning isn't necessarily in the word, it's in the interpretation. Yes, it's how we bring to it. And so I often hear people talk about mental health and I don't always know what it is the other person means when they say mental health, because most of the time when I hear mental health, the person, when, when we discuss it more, when they talk about their own mental health, they're not actually talking about health, they're talking about unhealthiness. When most people come to me and go, hey, I've got some mental health things going on, mm -hmm. what they're not talking about is, I'm doing really well. <laughs> yeah, hey, things are all lined up, they're great. Yes, what they mean I is, mean good. <laughs> I'm really anxious. Very similar to when people say, I'm having some physical health right. issues. Exactly. What they mean is my physical health is not doing well. But the problem that I think often in the way that we talk about it is what? I'm just imagining someone saying, my physical health is going great. Yeah, I'm just. <laughs> just like you tip wouldn't do that. Top yeah, shape. Yeah. Hey, Nathan, tip top shape over here. Yes, like, exactly. Yeah, this is not something people would but, say. So but we like, would say, you know, I haven't been feeling, or I need yes. it you know, I need to exercise more. I'm right. not feel, I'm really sluggish lately or whatever it might be. But you know what I found in that is when, when we talk about physical health, let's not even talk about mental health, let's talk about physical health for a moment. When we talk about physical health, most of us only know how to measure our physical health in terms of what's going wrong and how we minimize it. So mm -hmm. what I mean is, okay, I'm physically healthy as long as nothing's going wrong. Right. Right? Which sounds fine. And that, yeah, I'm physically healthy unless I have some number that's high. Yeah, or, the, and the numbers are or, not about, you know, we have some ranges, right? With Or I have, or I'm sick all the time or whatever it is. Yes, and be. I will say this, doctors clearly have this is what it is. Uh, and I would say that in terms of also weight mm -hmm. and exercise and things like that, they have metrics. I'm talking about the way we talk yeah, to our one personal, another. Our personal interpretation of right. what, if what you, it means to be physically healthy. If you were to come to me and say, Nathan, are you healthy? Mm -hmm. I'd go, uh, well. And then I'd have to think through mm -hmm. and go, and as long as there's no sickness, no illness, I'd go, yeah, probably. And then I'd go, well, I probably could drop a few pounds. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I could probably do this. And what I found, and this is where I got to... When I started going to the gym about five, six years ago, I did not have a clear picture of what it looked like for me to be physically healthy. Most people now agree that BMI is a terrible way to measure whether mm -hmm. you are physically healthy because right. any athlete that has a lot of muscle mass, mm -hmm. their BMI is way through the roof mm -hmm. because it's based on height and, height and weight. And so that's not a healthy way. So then you got to look and go, well, it's body fat percentage or XYZ. What about the, the old big bone logic? <laughs> yeah, how does that work? <laughs> Doc, 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 tell me about these big bones. Big bones. <laughs> Give me a scanner. Tell me about my big bones. Uh -huh. But <laughs> that's good. But, but I found out when I would go and I would see these guys at the gym who I would talk to in the locker right. room and stuff. And I would look at them and be like, oh, this guy could be like, this guy could be like a movie star, right? right. Like this guy's like, are you a bodybuilder? Are you Visually whatever? perfect. Yes, perfect. you look and you're like, I'd go, this dude is ripped. Right. This guy's jacked. And then when you listen to them talk often, they sound like, well, this is probably sexist on my part, but I go, you sound like teenage girls in the locker room because they're like, my calves aren't exactly. It's like, your calves look better than my calves. Like, I wish I had your calves. Your calves, like my, my biceps, they're looking okay, but they're not looking great. And what oh I learned gosh. was- <laughs> This really happens? Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. The calf so women don't do it really with each other so much okay. as they they internalize all that. <laughs> okay, they don't. They tell, might they, with someone close to them, but they, they usually are. In, they are not walking around the locker room being like, "Hey, my calves." Or yes. like, or like, oh no, man. They're, take they're, a look at this. But, you're, but man, but your buys and tries. There's, yeah. <laughs> don't look at those. Calves. You're all buys and tries and delts. Yeah, <laughs> you you really knock it out of the park on arm day. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I would look and I'd eventually go, okay. Even people I would look at and go, that guy's like a physical specimen. Yeah. 
even they think I'm not as healthy as I should be. Mm -hmm. And it becomes this kind of sliding scale. Mm -hmm. And I think often we do the same thing when it comes to our mental health. Oh, I think so. Is we have this image in our head of what is mental health perfection. And all it is is a little less stressed than I am right now. Yeah, I think it's... I think it's less less stress than I am right now. A less ang anxiety, a little happier, a little lighter, yes. a little bit uh, ca more carefree, and yes. um, I sleep at night. And you know, yes. I I just don't have a lot of worries in the world. Things like that, things that are really bogging me down. And so we don't really. I don't really want to get into what would be mental health because necessarily either one of us know. Now we yeah, have two people talking to you all. We're not doctors. <laughs> yes, I do not have, because I don't have those numbers, right? right? Uh, you know, because I would also not tell because I can't tell you off the top of my head what your blood sugar should be. So I got no idea. Either. I can't tell you. My wife, for some reason, knows all of those numbers. Because I don't I know. she medical records or something at one She point. did. So maybe that's what it is. I don't know. She also has, uh, if you ever sit with like a group of like, older people and they're all like never my blood sugar was x and they go oh no <laughs> and i'm like mm -hmm, that, that does sound that bad that number really you said because one time i remember <laughs> sitting with someone and they said a number and i thought i thought it sounded high and they go oh that's terrible and they go oh i've been working on it for a while and the oh. doctor said i said oh it's supposed to be low <laughs> <laughs> that's when you're like oh, it's supposed to be high. i should have waited before responding i should have looked at you and said what you said because <laughs> i was not sure so I don't know. I don't know what you would look at and say for a, a mental health professional, what they would say, hey, these are the metrics these to are know. The metrics. Right, you're doing well. I think what you and I, as believers, the conversation we want to have is what is it that Jesus would have for us, right? That we start to look at, and once again, not even measure, but to go, what am I even pursuing? Is all I'm pursuing in my life mm -hmm. mental health, mm -hmm. physical health? Mm -hmm. Or is there something else that Jesus has that encompasses all of those things? So we know that Jesus wants us to be mentally, spiritually, emotionally, physically healthy. Yes. And we know that in part because of the way he lived. Yeah, that's right. I think when you look at Jesus, you can see all the range of, well, let's just start with physical health. We know that Jesus ate. Mm -hmm. we, 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 have, we have records of Jesus eating. We have records of Jesus sleeping. Mm -hmm. We have Jesus taking time, as we've talked about in previous episodes, to get away, to be alone, mm -hmm. right? To take these kind of breaks and rest periods right. from people. We can see Jesus taking care of his physical health as well as you could see in a document that was not designed to right. talk about Jesus' physical. <laughs> Believe and, it or not, there is not and, a physical report of Jesus. that No one, we don't know what Jesus' BMI was. No, we don't know. <laughs> and we certainly don't know what the guys at the gym would have said about him. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Oh, Jesus, man. those are some great calves. <laughs> Jesus, you got the best biceps, man. Yeah. But I think... I, so we don't know that. That's not what the God... The, certainly Hollywood has made Jesus Sure, into yes. Him. You can certainly see that in, in, in Hollywood depictions yes. of Jesus. <laughs> but that's not what the Gospels are there to no. design, is to tell us how Jesus physically lived. It's also not designed to tell us about his mental health. Mm -hmm. But what we do see about Jesus is we do see a Jesus who has emotions that run all the way from, as we often talk about, uh, people often refer to them as the negative emotions, but we say there are no negative emotions. Right, they're just emotions. Right, but maybe the more complicated and difficult right. emotions to often deal with. Things like sadness. We see Jesus, you talked about yeah. that on the episode, Jesus weeping at the tomb of Lazarus. Mm -hmm. We also see Jesus dealing with something, though he told, so this is where everyone wants to get into, is he told people not to worry, but we see Jesus having this, angst, maybe mm -hmm. the best way to say it, before he goes to the cross, this intense level of angst, mm -hmm. right, to the point that he sweats blood, Yes, right? So he is certainly very concerned about what the right. cross is going to be, mm -hmm. right? And so you see th that level in Jesus. We also see Jesus having uh, anger in a divine sense, right? Frustration, right? Yeah, well, certainly, fr he certainly had lots of frustration yeah. with the disciples. Oh my gosh, <laughs> just read how he spoke to them from time to time. <laughs> but there's e there a lot of scholars would translate the word compassion that mm -hmm. we see for Jesus as this form of anger, like when you see um, someone wronging someone mm -hmm. else. You feel not only bad for the person who got wrong, but, but this 
level of anger that it ever even happened. Mm -hmm. So you see those, and then you certainly see the joy of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. The peace of Jesus, the gentleness, all those, all, all those, those yes, so speak. <laughs> all those other emotional aspects, right? Um, and so I think it is, for me, it is clear to say uh, emotional and mental health, as we've said before, does not mean that I never feel sad. Nope. Or that I never feel angst or concern or even, uh, I think the way Jesus would describe it, once again, because the language you choose right. says a lot about it. Let's I think what Jesus we, is definite. Yeah, I think what we would call worry, we have to split into two things. There's, there's a level of I'm choosing worry, mm -hmm. and then worry is kind of thrust upon me. And what I mean is the idea of concern, concern fear. Concern versus consumption of worry. Right, just the, just you know, that healthy level of fear, as I think I've talked on here before about mm -hmm. positive anxiety. Mm -hmm. We have. That I, that, I, that I want to care about things in my life to the point that I would go, well, I'm a little nervous, mm -hmm. right? Or, it matters. Yes, mm -hmm. or the, the fear of, man, I'm going to a cross and this is gonna hurt, mm -hmm. and I don't want it to hurt. Yeah, I mean, you would sweat some blood. You might, you might <laughs> feel a little uh, upset about that, right? It's not that I never feel that. I mm -mm. never feel a little bit of stress. I never feel sad. I never feel angry. It's ultimately that I become the kind of person that whatever I am feeling or whatever situation I am, I am able to respond right. in a way that honors God. Right. So it's in, it's not in the, mo in the feeling and in the moment there. It's how I respond in, re in reference to that. Right. It's the goal. The goal, I think, and I'm just saying from a believer's standpoint, is that I want to be the kind of person I, I would say is I am, I almost would want to kind of drop the, the term of healthy out of my head because that feels amorphous to me. Right. What I want to be is emotionally and mentally responsible. I want to be physically responsible. Right. Well, and that's, you know, when you say that, it, we're all given... We're all, we all come to the table yes. with a different set of things, right? We've yes. got a different, we could say we all have a different deck of cards. Or right. We all We're all have playing the same game, the same but not game. everyone got the same hand. Right. Not everyone got the same hand. And we all have things, whether it be like biochemical things, sure. it might be a physical thing, it might be trauma in our past, it might right. be great things in our past, but that is all what shapes and forms us too. Yes. And those all impact that. So we have to do, if we look at how Jesus lived his life, he certainly had some really yes. traumatic things, had yes. many different things. It was how he responded in those. So he, some of those things may not have been his fault. However, yes. He does own the. He is responsible for his actions and yes. for how he's going to handle that. Well, I I think one thing we don't think a lot about when you talk about just difficult circumstances growing up, Jesus had a mom oh. who who had him and said, "I was a virgin when this happened." Yes. Right now, maybe we don't know. Maybe she didn't tell everyone there, but. People know how to do math even back then. And when they're going to figure out either that's Joseph's kid and Joseph was shameful because they had had sex before they got married right. and got pregnant and then they tried to lie about it, which would be a whole other level of shame that you were trying to hide this. Or I can't remember which of the Gospels, but there's one, there's one place, and I can't remember which one, where someone refers to Jesus and says, isn't he a Samaritan? Mm -hmm. And... I remember hearing a scholar say that what they're really saying is, uh, isn't isn't he biracial in the mm -hmm. sense of m that some people would have thought a Roman soldier had what? taken advantage of his, of, mother. of his mother, and they lied and said, "Oh, it's Joseph's baby." That there was so there might there might have been rumors going. Or once again, this is stuff we don't know, but you can kind of look at the text and go, "How difficult must it have been to grow oh. up?" In this situation, either way, there was some sort of shame toward his yes. parents, and well, I mean, he was the child. From well, let's take back what we know for sure happened, which is Jesus had to, his parents had to flee the country when he was born, become refugees in Egypt mm -hmm. for a few years because the king of his country decided because of his birth, he had to kill all the baby boys in the land. Now, not everyone else didn't know that about him, but imagine that that's a story that gets told right. to you when you're a child. 
in just the way of life that is that, you know, when I'm a little older, we had to come back to the country. Right. And the way all of this happens. So Jesus had these difficult things in his life, and eventually he knows, I'm going to a cross. Yes, I, and I know I'm going to die in this way. Which is a life experience I have not had. Me either. So, And I really hope I don't. Yeah, so I look at, I look at this is not a life experience <laughs> I have had. Jesus had different things to deal with. And then there are people in my life who I know, and they have learned over time because of their, chemi- they have chemical imbalances mm-hmm. that make it where it is difficult for them to process all of the emotions in their life. I know of other people in my life who have had such severe trauma in their past mm-hmm. that it has changed the way their the wiring of their brain works, that they don't they think thoughts differently mm-hmm. and it works differently for them. My own children have a level to, to, to of that in their own life. And when I when I look at that, I go, you know what, me and them, mental health may look different. Mm-hmm. for the two of us. You might have the same exact definition. Yes, and so I can't look at them and go, well, this is what I do, so you should do this. Right. Because it's different for every person. But what both of us have to do right. is we both have to be responsible mm-hmm. with what we have. And the way I hear a lot of people say this, this is probably not new to people, is it may not be your fault, mm-hmm. but this is now your responsibility. It was not your fault, the deck of cards you get. Right. It was not your fault that this person hurt you or that That's this... right. You that or you that have you're, this, this yeah, you know, your brain works this certain way, yes. or you have this physical thing, or whatever. But but you have it is your responsibility to do something with it, right? And so I think the the what Jesus would say is we want to become the kind of people that in any given situation mm-hmm. I can emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually respond in the way that He would have me do, mm-hmm. right? Based on who I am, my personality, what's gone on in my life. You know, all my chemical wiring, all of that stuff, what would be that? Now, that may take some work. Yeah, I was going to say, that don't hear us saying you're just going to turn to Jesus and do no, this. I mean, no, we've no, talked no. about this in the past, too. Work may look like, and it should look like a lot of different things, right? Yes. And there's a lot of time. We talked recently about spending time in the quiet and working right. through some things, identifying right. your emotion talking to God, staying close to your father. But then we've also talked in other episodes too about sometimes it is more challenging than that. And you might need someone to talk through that with you. You might sure. need to go to counseling or and, and that get counsel, tools from them. Tools from yeah. them. There may be some biochemical thing, the brain that that needs to be assessed. I mean we there are a lot of different layers in that. So, you know, we yeah. we we are not saying don't don't do things about it, but we are saying, you know, we are responsible for it. And that's what Jesus has said said and shown us that we are responsible for playing the hand that we were dealt. Yes. And so we have to step in and do that. We 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 have to take responsibility for it. And I think when you talk about response Ability, I think it's a really important thing to even break that word in our mind to. It's about being able to respond right. appropriately. That I'm able to respond to God's spirit at work, mm-hmm. so where God would call me to lead. I'm able to respond to this other person, mm-hmm. right? I'm able to respond to what's going on with me. And we've already talked about, you know, I feel this stuff going on within me. So I need to go respond to that. I need to, and, and not react to it. Mm-hmm. You know, we talk about Sometimes you're just reacting. And so you've got all this stuff going on within you and your kid has all this stuff going on with them. And then all of that, plus you've got all this stuff in your past and then maybe you've got these chemical imbalances or whatever it is. You have all this stuff at play Mm -hmm. and you are just reacting to what you feel or reacting to what they do. You're not responding to it. Mm -hmm. And so it's different for every person of how do I get myself to a place, right, where I am able to respond Mm -hmm. in love, like Christ. You know, I used to always say to people, if love is patient, love is kind, then sleep, proper sleep is critical to love. Because how many of us struggle to be patient and kind when we did not get sleep the night before? Me, for sure. A hundred percent me. And so learning healthy sleep habits, which is a physical thing. It's just, I got to have that physical thing. I just got to do these steps because that matters. (laughs) Yes. I always say my wife, I drink lots of water. My wife struggles to drink water. And I always tell her, you got to be hydrated because Mm -hmm. hydration 
messes with your ability to be patient and kind. You're a little more irritable because you're tired and your body, your body's your kind body's of not, Anything that your body's not functioning at, as it should be. Yes. Anything physical. So if you're not eating well or you're not sleeping well yes. or you're not taking in the nutrients that you need for your That's body, right. the machine to function, that is a problem. And That's so, something to take responsibility for right. and address. And so I would say to people, the same thing is true. If, if you have this past trauma or mm-hmm. this past hurt or just something about the way you were raised, it, it triggers all this stuff within you when you're dealing with your spouse or with your kids mm-hmm. or just with other people. The responsible thing to do, the, so you can respond ably like Christ, will be there are things I need to do. And maybe that is just through prayer. Maybe you're able to accomplish that through being alone and going through that breath prayer thing we talked to. But you may, like I've had to do, Molly's had to do, Mm -hmm. a lot of people in my life have had to do. You may have to go sit with someone who can help, who has the skills, right? To break it down. To help break it down. A therapist or a counselor who can sit with you and say, hey, here's what you don't know about how your brain works. Mm-hmm. Just like a, a doctor of your body tells yeah. you, here's what you don't know about how your body works. Right. And they can say, this this is, if you would replace this thought with this thought, or if you do this and do this, you would be able to respond more ably right. to what's going on. And I think that is what good, especially Christian counselors, can do is it's both parts. Right. They're able to bring the therapeutic side to it, but then also remind you like, hey, the goal of this is so that you can respond to God better. When I did counseling a while back, one of the best things that I, you know, I've, I've talked on here before about just kind of remembering that, yeah. you know, that God made me a certain way and he gifted me with certain skills and that those are things that, um, you know, he has put into me so that I can love other people yeah. <laughs> appropriately. But when I was going through counseling, one of the best things was that she always remind, we always started and ended with that, that, you know, these are the good things that, that God has given you. And in the middle, we did all of the other, yes. these are tools, these are things, but it always started and it ended with the, you know, constant reminder of this is, you know, God, it, the, we are doing this because right. God has made you a certain way. And in order to love others the way that he would want you to, we have to work through these other things. That's right, because the goal is to love your neighbor as yourself, which means you have been physically, emotionally, Mm -hmm. spiritually, mentally responsible. You have been, you know, you've been getting healthier, Mm -hmm. you know, because once again, healthy sometimes feels amorphous, but Mm -hmm. you are, you are able to handle the sadness that comes into your life, the stress and anxiety that comes into your life, the anger that comes into your life appropriately. I've said to uh, some people in my life, I used to say to some students that I knew, and even with my own children, talking with them of saying, um, in particular, there was someone who at certain seasons, certain events in their life, certain holidays, right. they always just were down because of things in their past that re- they really just struggled with. And these events, this mm-hmm. time of year, it brought up all those feelings. And I remember saying several times to people, you may always be sad on this holiday. Mm -hmm. Now, for many of us, what we think mental health means is I can somehow like cut that nerve off. My mental health is great. I'm no longer going to be sad on that day. I'll never feel that sadness again. And I said, you know, because of what happened in your life, and this was a person who who a parent had just left them. They were from childhood. They weren't there on the holidays Mm -hmm. at that time. And I said, you may, you, I think Jesus is sad that your parent wasn't there. And it may be the responsible approach, the correct response to this sad thing is for you to feel sad. What you want is to not get consumed by the sadness so you are unable to love other people and love yourself. So what you may have to start to do is to respond ably to that sadness. And you you know going into the holiday, going into these events, I'm going to be sad Mm -hmm. and that's okay Mm -hmm. because this is a sad thing. Mm-hmm. But I know God loves me. I never forget that. I know these other people in my life, they love me. I know that there's, and you know, it may be through therapy, you've learned things about your parents or you've learned things about this. You've been able to kind of see things and go, now I can even see things from their perspective. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm able to, once again, bring all of that into the equation and then respond mm-hmm. like Christ would have me respond. 
And to me, that's mentally and emotionally healthy. Absolutely. It's just, I don't have to do that on the holidays. And that doesn't mean I'm more mentally or emotionally healthy. No, but you might have to do that in April when something's really... Sure, that's what I mean. It's a different different thing. Your cards are different. But, But for someone to look at me who has not had that life experience and go, that's what I should feel. Mm-hmm. Just like looking at someone saying, I wish I had your calves. <laughs> wish it's, I had your mental health, man. <laughs> I wish I had your mental health. That's not, that's not, and it doesn't <clears throat> help you. It right. only will hinder you to try and compare your oh, mental health thief to, of joy. to mine. What we both want to do is I want to respond to the deck of cards I was handed mm-hmm. in a way that I can still be blessed. Mm-hmm. That, that's how we wrap it back all together. Here we go. That someone might be able to look at me and say, you know, you were blessed because even though this thing happened to you, mm-hmm. you've been able to meet God in that. Mm-hmm. And he is the ultimate blessing that you want. And I think for all of us who are parents, that's something we have to help our kids with yep. at some point. But we have to model it first. Always. <laughs> and a lot of our kids are growing up in situations where they're going to have things in their life that get handed to them. And I don't just mean, it may be, you know. <laughs> We're going to hand them some things. That's what I mean. It may be something. The truth that, is, we it, probably it may are. Be that, you, that, that we've messed up. It may be things that we said that we shouldn't have said. Or it may be, you know, me and, you know, me and my, my wife were, you know, you get divorced. And now that's a situation your kid has to deal with. And you feel a level of guilt around it. You feel all these things. And, you know, they feel these things. And the goal, once again, isn't how do I just cut those nerves off so I don't feel it anymore? It's how do I respond Mm -hmm. now in this situation? You know, maybe I wish things had gone different. Maybe I wish I would have done something different. Mm -hmm. But how do I help my kid understand, hey, you can emotionally respond in this situation like Jesus wants you to. Mm -hmm. And you may find the holidays difficult now. And you may have this. Or maybe your kid gets bullied at school. Mm -hmm. Or maybe some thing that you would say that's a really small thing. But because there are things in my past that I look back now that have were defined finding moments of oh, me yeah. changing the way I thought about myself. And when I look at them objectively, I go, those are really small things, but I've held on to it. But they grew for you. <laughs> it's been all these years. And that may happen for your kid. But before you can even really help them understand it, we've got to model it for them of, hey, it's okay to be sad. It's okay to be stressed. It's okay to feel these things. How do we meet God in the middle mm-hmm. of this and respond to what we want in this moment? and not become overwhelmed by it. Right. And if you're in a place where you feel overwhelmed by yes. something, you, you know, there are resources. We'll, Whoa, you know, we'll say, reach, reach out, out to, to us. us. We will reach out to us. We we can connect you with someone who might be able to help you work through some of these things. We can give you some tools. We can just talk to you. Yeah. Um, you know, it, life sometimes feels very overwhelming and very heavy. And when you're in that place, that's the hardest place to get yeah. sometimes starting and actually taking that responsibility and saying, okay, yeah, I'm ready to do something about it is sometimes the most challenging. So, Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we want you to reach out to us and um, we're here. So we hope this was helpful for you guys. We know yeah. that, uh, you know, our kids make us crazy. And so yeah. we might have already been crazy to I begin with. Other things I think what we're learning crazy. is that everything else has also made us crazy. But when we yes. have kids, we, it, it magnifies it sometimes. But anyway, um, We are glad you are here with us today, and we will be back with another mental health discussion. Maybe not quite worded like that, but another crazy discussion in our next episode. So if you have questions or you have any comments for us, feel free to send us in some. We get some from time to time, and we like to address them. So have a good day. Oh, you did it right. I did it right this time. That's good. Normally I say great and then have to switch it. So have a good day. Take care.